Hello students, this is Professor uh, McDermott with Lecture 11 on uh, this country's role in World War II. Um, but before I start, just want to say if you haven't watched the FDR video um, and started participating in that discussion, please um, go ahead and do that first because it's in that video that uh, You'll learn about the early years of the FDR administration and uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal. Uh, this lecture comes after that. So, uh, ever since World War I, the United States had stayed in an isolationist mood. That is, uh, people felt that the sacrifice of lives and money uh, in World War I had not been worth it and they had reverted to the traditional American uh, viewpoint that we should just stay out of foreign conflicts and mind our own business. So, um, as Adolf Hitler uh, began his uh, aggressive moves to take over Europe in the late 1930s, most Americans turned a blind eye. They um, paid no attention as Hitler snapped up uh, Austria and Czechoslovakia and uh, this had to do with the legacy of World War I. I had mentioned that um, there was an attempt to give every ethnic group its own homeland, its own nation, but there were large numbers of German-speaking people in um, Austria especially, but also in Czechoslovakia, and Hitler used that as an excuse to uh, take over those places and incorporate those regions into his ever-expanding Third Reich, Third Empire of uh, Germany. Um, now, the isolationist sentiment in the United States was uh, best expressed through an organization that formed to try to keep uh, the United States out of the European conflict that people knew was coming. This group was called the America First Committee, and the main spokesman for this group was none other than the great aviator uh, Charles Lindbergh, who went around the country speaking in favor of isolationism. And uh, your documents for uh, the second discussion in this module basically um, consist of a debate between Lindbergh and FDR about whether it's a good thing for the U.S. to get involved in this conflict, whether it's a good thing for the U.S. to get involved um, in overseas matters in general. Um, I've posted a, an article which just came out a couple of weeks ago um, in the Week magazine, also in the module, that uh, I would encourage you to take a look at because it really sums up the debate between um, isolationism uh, and interventionism very well, and the fact that this article just came out kind of shows us that this is still very much a live issue. Uh, for example, since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan haven't turned out the way that uh, we had all hoped, uh, many Americans have embraced isolationism uh, once again and turned away from interventionism. So, like imperialism, this is very much a live issue, uh, very much so. There was also the question of whether the United States should open its doors to the many refugees who began flocking out of Europe uh, as Nazism expanded in the late 1930s, especially the Jews, because everybody knew that uh, the Nazi regime was hostile um, to the Jews. They had no idea that Hitler intended to kill all the Jews, that idea had not yet surfaced, but uh, they knew that Jews were being oppressed and that many of them wanted to come um, to this country. Now, <clears throat> the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was really the leader um, in the administration of the effort to try to get Congress to accept more refugees, more immigrants, and uh, of course Eleanor was FDR's conscience on many matters, and uh, especially on this one. But Congress was very reluctant to change the immigration quotas that it had set up back in 1921 and 1924 with those strict limits on uh, how many immigrants could come from each country. And when you think about it, it's, it's not hard to figure out the reasons why. The country was in the middle of a depression. Um, up to 25% of the workforce was unemployed at various points during the Great Depression. 
And these immigrants represented uh, competition for jobs for uh, people that were already in um, the United States. And so Congress refused uh, to raise the quotas at all um, before and uh, during World War II. There was also, of course, anti-Semitism. Um, the hatred of Jews, while not as prevalent here as it was in Nazi Germany, certainly was a living force uh, in this country, and there was discrimination against Jews in education and in other places in this country. Um, and there was also a certain legitimate fear that uh, if we simply opened our doors to any number of people from Europe, that we might be playing into Hitler's hands. And the reason for this was that, uh, as became clear later, when Hitler took over the Netherlands, Norway, um, Belgium, uh, he had sent in uh, people from Germany into those countries first to prepare the way for the Nazi invasions, to undermine the regimes in those countries and to make it easier for the Nazis to invade. And these um, German representatives in those countries were called the fifth column in, in those countries. And so um, people were afraid that uh, Hitler might try to smuggle some immigrants into this country and they might become a fifth column to undermine and destabilize our um, government. And uh, if you think about it, this is really not that different from the fear, uh, for instance, that if we let in a lot of Syrian refugees nowadays, we might let in a bunch of terrorists. This has been a very much a live issue in the current uh, political scene. Um, so that represented another, uh, another obstacle to these immigrants being admitted to the United States. And there's some very tragic um, stories um, that happened uh, as immigrants tried desperately to get to this country uh, and were turned away. The most famous uh, happened in May of 1939. There was a ship called the St. Louis that had managed to get out of Germany with 933 German Jews on board and they made it to Miami, Florida and uh, they were there in the harbor in Miami and they began sending telegrams and urgent requests to the White House and Congress to please let them in. They were just trying to escape from uh, anti-Semitic hatred in um, Germany. And so this caused, of course, a lot of debate, but finally uh, the government's decision was not to let them in. They told those people to leave our shores and to go right back to Germany and that is what happened. And nearly all of those 930 German Jews on board the St. Louis eventually died in uh, German concentration camps. So, um, very sad story, very sad story, whether or not we can understand the reasons um, for the hostility to admitting refugees. So the United States, <clears throat> as uh, Europe sank uh, deeper and deeper into the inevitability of war, the United States simply remained neutral in the European conflict and did not take sides. But the impetus that ultimately brought us into the war uh, came from the Far East, uh, from Japan specifically. Now, ever since the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, uh, Japan had been a rising world superpower. It had built up a tremendously effective army, navy, um, and air force. And uh, under its ruler, the Emperor Hirohito, in the 1930s, uh, Japan decided to establish an empire. And it began by uh, moving into China. It already had um, Korea, but it, it, it then began to move into China to try to take over um, that nation. Um, and as they did so, they committed some of the worst, most horrifying wartime atrocities that have ever been documented in human history. The most infamous incident uh, took place in the Chinese city of Nanking in 1937. When the Japanese troops marched into Nanking, um, they decided to make an example of the citizens there to try to terrify 
the rest of the Chinese and to surrender. And so over a period of months, they brutally uh, tortured, raped, and murdered hundreds of thousands of uh, Chinese residents of Nanking. Now, the world knew about this. Uh, news got out um, to the rest of the world, and uh, people in the United States knew that this had happened. But the isolationist sentiment was so strong that even the rape of Nanking uh, did not um, lead us to try to help the Chinese resist Japan. And even after, in December 1937, the Japanese ship uh, sank uh, one of our ships, a United States Navy ship called the Panay, uh, which was anchored in the Yangtze River in China. Even after that, even after the Japanese attacked us directly, um, the United States still did not want to get involved in a conflict with Japan. That just shows you how deep the isolationist sentiment went. We did, however, uh, give some support um, to the leader of China, whose name was Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who led what was called the Nationalist Party, um, and was trying to, uh, at the same time as, as uh, resisting Japan, was trying to fend off a communist revolution led by um, Mao Zedong. Eventually, the communists and the nationalists did join forces for a while to try to uh, save China from Japanese aggression. So, essentially, the United States uh, sat aside and did nothing as Japan took over much of China and even entered into a formal alliance with the two fascist dictatorships in Europe, Germany and Italy, um, who became known as the Axis uh, powers. And in World War II, um, England and later the United States and all the powers opposed to Germany, Italy, and Japan were known as the Allies. Well, World War II officially started on September the 1st, 1939, when um, the Nazis invaded Poland, but they had some help, surprisingly, from the communist dictatorship of Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. How did that come about? Well, Stalin was afraid that um, unless he made a deal with Hitler, that Hitler would set his sights on the Soviet Union next. And so uh, Hitler and Stalin made a secret treaty, which said that they would both invade Poland at the same time, which they did, and uh, carve up Poland. And uh, this was called the Non-Aggression Pact. Um, and so uh, that's exactly what happened. The Nazi tanks, which were called panzers, rolled into Poland, completely decimated the Polish military, which was still using horses, uh, in a lightning assault. And so Hitler's style of warfare became known as Blitzkrieg War, that is, uh, lightning war. Essentially, with the use of aircraft and tanks now, more than they had been used in World War I, the advantage returned to the attacking side in war and Hitler was able to mount very successful assaults uh, using this military technology. Um, by June 22, 1940, the Nazis had taken Paris and forced France um, out of the war, and essentially that left Great Britain all alone, um, knowing that Hitler set his sights next on an invasion of Great Britain. Uh, however, the uh, leaders of the Luftwaffe um, the German Air Force convinced Hitler that it would be foolish to invade England with troops until the Luftwaffe had established superiority in the air. And so Hitler gave in to that. And so the Battle of Britain, which uh, happened from July to October of 1940, was entirely fought in the air. It was a struggle between the Luftwaffe and the RAF, the Royal Air Force, um, for uh, air supremacy over the island of um, Great Britain. Now, the RAF was greatly outnumbered um, by the Luftwaffe. There were only about 900 British fighter planes um, against about 2,200 German planes at any given time. Um, and so, uh, as the Luftwaffe began to bomb London and other large urban areas in Britain, 
Um, about 20,000 British civilians were killed in what became known as the Blitz. Um, however, the British did have some advantages. First of all, they had uh, more modern planes than the Germans did. Second, they had better radar systems, so often they were able to detect incoming uh, German planes before they could do damage. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, um, the Germans managed to crack the uh, Enigma code that Germany, excuse me, the British managed to crack the Enigma code that was being used by all the German uh, armed forces. Um, and you may have seen there was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called The Imitation Game with Benedict Cumberbatch that was all about how the British managed to do this, uh, break this supposedly unbreakable code. Essentially, uh, they had to construct the world's first computer um, in order to do it. And also they had the help of a large number of brilliant young women um, who were recruited into the code-breaking facility at Bletchley Park, England. So it's a, it's a fascinating story. But after the British cracked the German code, uh, they of course knew when the uh, Luftwaffe was planning to attack and they were able to defend uh, accordingly. Now, Franklin D. Roosevelt loved England. He was what we call an Anglophile. He loved uh, British culture. Um, he wanted the U.S. to get involved in the war on the British side. Um, even before the war started, he had met with the King of England, uh, George VI, and his wife, uh, Queen Elizabeth, at his estate in um, uh, Hyde Park, New York, which uh, was uh, memorialized in a film that came out a couple of years ago with Bill Murray called Hyde Park on Hudson. Um, so he met with King George VI. He was close friends with the new British Prime Minister as of early 1940, Winston Churchill. They had been corresponding for some time on a very friendly basis. Also, FDR was a religious man, and he belonged to the Church of England. He was an Episcopalian, uh, which is the name in this country of the Church of England. And so he had many, many ties binding him to um, the British people, and he really wanted to help the British in the war. But he had to be very careful about that, because in 1940, FDR was mulling over the idea of running for a third term as president. Now, you have to understand that ever since George Washington had stepped down at the end of his second term, uh, there had been a sort of informal understanding that presidents should only serve two terms in the White House out of respect to Washington. Uh, so it was totally unprecedented uh, that Roosevelt was thinking about running for a third term. He knew that voters would be suspicious about that, and he couldn't afford to anger the very many isolationist voters who didn't want the United States to get involved in this war. Now, uh, FDR did get renominated uh, by the Democratic Party and reelected in uh, 1940. And here's how that came about. Um, when the Democratic Convention was going on, he didn't actually attend, but he sent a message to the convention saying that he had no intention of running. However, if the Democratic Convention saw fit to nominate him, he would not refuse. He would agree to run. So while the delegates were standing there in Chicago, scratching their heads, uh, trying to figure out what this message meant, um, a voice... <laughs> began to be heard in the convention hall saying, we want Roosevelt, we want Roosevelt. And pretty soon, all the conventioners had taken up the chant, we want Roosevelt, we want Roosevelt. And pretty soon, FDR had been renominated by acclamation. But later, it came out that the mayor of Chicago, who was a Democrat named Edward Kelly, had gotten the Chicago Commissioner of Sewers to go down into the basement uh, where of the convention hall with a microphone and had cued him on when to actually start the chant. So it was this sewer commissioner in the basement who started the chant. Um, and so this became known as the voice from the sewer. But uh, even if this was a little shady, like Chicago politics always are, 
Uh, it did work to get FDR uh, renominated and ultimately uh, reelected. So now that he had a third term in in the bag, FDR was much freer um, to come out publicly and say that he thought the U.S. should support uh, Britain and the Allies in the war. Um, and he started this campaign on December 29th, 1940, with uh, perhaps the most famous of all of his fireside chats. Now, these were radio addresses that he would give a couple times a year um, to the American people, and everybody would tune in uh, all across the country to see what he had to say. The title of this fireside chat was The Arsenal of Democracy. And... Um, if you uh, know what an arsenal is, that's a, basically a warehouse for weapons. You get a sense of what FDR was getting at. Basically, he wanted um, the United States to become the weapons supplier for the free world. Uh, he wanted the United States to start providing um, tanks and ships and guns and ammo and all kinds of uh, war supplies to the British especially. Um, and in March 1941, FDR managed to convince Congress to pass a bill that did just that. Uh, the bill was called Lend-Lease, and the reason for this was that basically we lent the British a whole lot of war supplies, and in return they leased us uh, some military bases, mostly in the, in the Caribbean, uh, hence Lend-Lease. Um, and so we did begin to supply the Allied war effort uh, at this point. And also in July 1941, uh, Roosevelt finally moved to cut off U.S. sales of petroleum to Japan. Now, believe it or not, um, for four years after the rape of Nanking, we had actually been selling the Japanese Empire um, war supplies and especially petroleum. But uh, now FDR... Um, cut that off. And this left the Japanese in a real dilemma. Um, basically, Japan is a string of very overpopulated islands in the Pacific Ocean that have almost no natural resources, and especially they did not have any oil. So, if the Japanese were going to maintain and expand the empire they were building in China and elsewhere, uh, they had to find a, res uh, a place uh, to, find, to get oil. And the most logical um, place for them to get oil war, uh, was the colony known as the Dutch East Indies, um, off the coast of Southeast Asia, which uh, a series of islands that today we call Indonesia, but at that time were owned by the Netherlands. And so the Japanese prepared to invade the Dutch East Indies to get their oil. But they knew that the United States was not going to take that line down. Why? Because ever since the Spanish-American War, we had had uh, the Philippines, which were very close to the Dutch East Indies. And uh, the Japanese knew that FDR would never tolerate um, the Japanese taking over that area so close to our colonial possession, the Philippines. And so, that is why Japan decided to attack Pearl Harbor, uh, which may seem crazy, starting a war with us, but um, they believed it was necessary to deal uh, a crippling blow to the U.S. Pacific Fleet um, so that we could not retaliate against Japan when they invaded the East Indies. That was the goal of the Pearl Harbor attack. Now, um, some people, there's actually a conspiracy theory about this. Some people think that FDR actually knew the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor, but didn't do anything about it because he wanted us to get in the war. And he knew that the only way the U.S. could ever get into the war, uh, according to public opinion, was if we were actually attacked. Most historians think that's not true, and that uh, U.S. military intelligence did know that Japan was planning to attack somewhere, but um, the U.S. High Command did not believe that Japan was capable of attacking Pearl Harbor. It was thousands of miles away from Japan, um, 
and in those days uh, planes could not fly very far without having to refuel and so they expected the attack to have come someplace like Guam or maybe even the Philippines but not Pearl Harbor and that's why when Japan did attack Pearl Harbor on uh, December 7th 1941 um, our Pacific Fleet was taken totally by surprise, and a uh, number of ships were sunk. 2,400 of our uh, servicemen died. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, some of our ships were actually out cruising the Pacific at that time, so uh, the attack did not deal as much damage as the Japanese had hoped. But still, it was a very crippling uh, and humilita humiliating blow to our national sovereignty. Um, and so... Uh, FDR famously declared it was a date that would live in infamy, and the U.S. declared war on Japan. But that did not necessarily mean that we had to fight against Hitler. Uh, the terms of the treaty between Germany and Japan did not require Hitler to declare war on the U.S. Um, he could have just let us alone. But um, fortunately, <laughs> I guess we could say, um, Hitler decided to <laughs> declare war on us anyway, uh, and that is how we got into the European War. It didn't actually have to happen, but by this point in time, Hitler was so convinced that Germany was unstoppable. Really, all the successes had gone to his head. He had lost perspective on reality, and he believed that uh, Nazi Germany could beat the entire world, so he declared war on us. And um, as a matter of fact, Germany was now also at war with the Soviet Union because Hitler had turned against Stalin, betrayed his former ally, and attacked the Soviets in June of 1941. So that meant that <clears throat> as of December 1941, the main allies were uh, Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Um, and so uh, Hitler... Um, excuse me, Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt uh, entered into negotiations about how to proceed with the war. Stalin, uh, whose people were suffering terrible, terrible losses, the Soviets lost more men and women and children in this war than any other uh, nation, uh, really wanted Great Britain and the U.S. to invade Western Europe, and that would have taken some of the pressure off the Soviets. Um, but Churchill was very reluctant to do that. Why? Well, um, Churchill remembered World War I, and um, the British people remembered uh, getting bogged down on the Western Front of World War I, losing nearly a million soldiers, and Churchill just didn't want to get involved in that quagmire yet. He didn't think the Allies were ready. And so the compromise that was worked out was that the Allies would instead invade North Africa in 1942, which we did, um, and recapture North Africa from the Nazis. And then from North Africa in 1943, we hopped over to Italy and began fighting our way very slowly and painfully up the Italian um, peninsula. So Stalin didn't get his second front yet, but in a way, you could say there was a second front, in Europe in 1942, and that was happening in the air as British and American planes began um, indiscriminate bombings of um, not only German military installations but residential areas. Um, so before I go into that a little bit deeper, um, I should say that as soon as we got into the war, uh, basically all U.S. factory production was converted to war production. And so great corporations like Ford and GM and Boeing, all the others, stopped making products for the consumer market and started making war um, materials. And basically that meant that there was a huge demand for workers. And suddenly unemployment simply disappeared in this country. And so really it wasn't the New Deal that ended the Great Depression, it was the war. And in fact, World War II ended both the Depression and the New Deal because suddenly everybody's employed and you no longer have a need for New Deal programs like the WPA or the CCC. 
Um, and so those things simply dis disappeared as everybody went to work as part of the war effort. Now, um, in bombing German civilians, essentially, we were following through on the, to the type of total war that was invented by General William Tecumseh Sherman in his march through Georgia in 1864 in the Civil War. Previously, uh, armies generally did not target civilians, but in modern warfare it was believed that because warfare had become an all-out effort of the entire society, um, that it was legitimate to target civilians who were, after all, supporting the war effort. And so we bombed Germany mercilessly, and in fact, about 600,000 German civilians were killed by Allied bombing raids during World War II. However, there was one type of facility that we never made the slightest attempt to bomb, and those were the Nazi concentration camps, um, in which, as of 1941, uh, Jews were being exterminated uh, at an incredible rate. Now, FDR knew about this, at least as of 1942. Some people had actually managed to escape from Auschwitz, the death camp, and they had made it um, to Rome, and they had told the Pope about what was going on there, and Pope Pius XII alerted FDR to what was happening. So FDR knew about it, but the U.S. military uh, refused to draw up plans to bomb the concentration camps because they did not see it as a military um, objective. They didn't want to be distracted from the overall war effort and what needed to be done to win the war. So, uh, for better or for worse, for whatever reason, we never bombed the camps. Now, of course, if we had, it would have also killed all the Jews that were in the camps, so perhaps that was another reason not to do it. But it was a very painful, I guess, uh, decision that later has become very controversial. Um, well, the Pacific War went badly for us um, from the start. Um, after Pearl Harbor, Japan immediately took over the Philippines. Um, and this led to an episode called the Bataan Death March. Basically, 25,000 U.S. and Filipino soldiers um, were captured by the Japanese, and they were forced to march up the Bataan Peninsula to um, Japanese POW camps. Uh, and along the way, actually there were more soldiers than that, but actually 25,000 was the number of deaths of U.S. and Filipino personnel on the Bataan Death March because of mistreatment, because of hunger, because of thirst and exposure. Um, why did the Japanese treat POW so badly? Uh, and, and this is really true. If you saw the movie Unbroken, um, came out a couple of years ago, um, the treatment of POWs by the Japanese depicted in that movie was, is pretty accurate. Okay. But this had to do with Japanese culture. Um, basically, Japan, Japan was still very much influenced by the old warrior code of the samurai. And according to this code, which was called Bushido, um, anybody who surrendered basically was a coward and lost his manhood and was totally unworthy um, to live. This is why during World War II, um, Japanese, instead of surrendering, would frequently just kill themselves. There's many examples where U.S. troops tried to get the Japanese to surrender, and Japanese soldiers would simply commit suicide because it was considered so shameful uh, for them uh, to surrender. And it's also the reason why Japanese pilots were willing to fly death missions, suicide missions, and crash themselves into U.S. aircraft carriers, ships, and, and so forth, um, these pilots were called kamikazes. They're kind of ancestors of today's uh, terrorist suicide bombers. So all this had to do with Japanese attitude to surrender. Well, um, it also uh, the, the treatment of POWs by Japan definitely contributed to the very hard and bitter feelings that were experienced in this war. Basically, um, the U.S. saw the Japanese as barbaric, uh, evil. The Japanese saw us as an inferior mongrel race. Um, you know, they considered themselves to be racially pure. Um, 
whereas we were a mixture of many different races and nationalities. And so on both sides, you could say there were racial stereotypes um, that came into play, and this Pacific War uh, was, in a way, a profoundly racist one. And that truth was perhaps best expressed by the order signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Executive Order 9066 in February 1942, which ordered that all the Japanese uh, Americans, whether they had been born in Japan or born in this country, who were living in the west coast of, this, of America, would be rounded up, and for the duration of the war, they would be put into camps, uh, basically held in custody in these uh, internment camps. And so that order was... Um, carried out, um, and about 110,000 Japanese Americans were confined to the camps during, um, during the war. These were not death camps. I mean, we didn't kill or exterminate these Japanese internees, but it was a huge loss for these people. They lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost their livelihood, and they lost their dignity in a certain way by being forced into um, the camps. Eleanor Roosevelt tried um, to get FDR to release at least some people from the camps, and during the war, a, a good number of people were released, some of them uh, young men to actually fight in the war on our side, others um, to go work in other cities in the East Coast with a sponsor. Um, but still, this was a massive violation of human rights. It's one that the U.S. government later apologized for and gave some financial payments to the survivors of. Now, what was our strategy in the Pacific War? Well, basically, our goal was to get close enough to Japan that we could bomb the Japanese uh, mainland. And in order to do that, it was necessary, basically, to capture all the Pacific Islands one at a time. Uh, basically leapfrogging uh, from island to island and trying to get close enough to Japan to bomb them. <laughs> At this point, you know, I, I, I learn a lot from students. Um, and one time I was, I was giving this lecture and a student raised his hand. He said, well, why didn't we just bomb them from Siberia, from the Soviet Union? I mean, if the Soviets were our allies. And I had to scratch my head and say I didn't know the answer to that. And so I, I went and did some research and found out that actually Stalin had made a non-aggression pact with Japan as well, saying that the Soviets would not enter the war against Japan. And since Stalin had his hands full with Hitler, he didn't want to violate that treaty. And so Stalin wouldn't let us bomb Japan from the Soviet Union. And, and so we had to go through the painful process of working our way by island by island towards Japan. We'll get back to that later. Right now I want to focus on the effects, some effects on the home front, uh, especially starting with the effect on African Americans. Now, um, a historic moment in 1936 when FDR was uh, elected to his second term, this was the first presidential election in history when the majority of African Americans voted Democratic. Um, previously, pretty much all African Americans had voted Republican. It was the party of Lincoln, after all. But um, black voters really liked Roosevelt, and especially they loved Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was an amazing woman, uh, as I'm sure you've, you've seen on the video. She had more moral courage than any ten average men, <laughs> I would say. And especially, she never missed an opportunity to reach out to the black community. One famous example, um, the Daughters of the American Revolution, as an organization she was a member of, refused to let the black classical singer Marian Anderson perform for them. And so Eleanor immediately resigned her membership in that group, and she arranged a huge public concert for Anderson in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And so blacks really appreciated that, uh, her efforts to reach out to them. And so many of them voted for FDR in 36, and that was the beginning of the shift of African Americans from the Republican Party to the Democrats. However, um, blacks were lukewarm about the war effort at first, and that's not surprising, because the U.S. military was still totally segregated. And... Um, 
black units were usually not used in combat, at least early in the war. Um, later more so, but early in the war, um, used mostly for menial tasks like digging latrines and cooking and things like that. Um, there were, of course, the famous Tuskegee Airmen from Tuskegee, Alabama, um, and other units that did fight with distinction in the war, but, but in the war effort, blacks were being discriminated against, especially early in the war. Um, so African-American leaders tried to target these policies and to get them changed. There was also discrimination happening in terms of war production. Some factories, especially in the South, were refusing to hire black workers uh, to produce war material. Um, the most powerful black leader at this time was a man named A. Philip Randolph. He was uh, the head of a mostly black labor union called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. <clears throat> and so Randolph went to FDR and he said, look, unless you do something about this discrimination, um, we are going to stage a massive march on Washington that will really embarrass the administration. And uh, so you see that the idea of a march on Washington was actually floated more than 20 years before it finally came to pass in 1963. Um, so with Eleanor Roosevelt once again acting as an intermediary, FDR finally gave in on this issue and in June 1941 issued another order saying that from thenceforth uh, war producers were not to discriminate on the basis of race. Um, and so the war March on Washington was canceled and more and more African Americans began to flock north to get these uh, very good well-paying uh, jobs in factories. The Great Migration really exploded again. 700,000 blacks uh, moved from the south to the north or the west um, during World War II. And you better believe there was a connection between um, World War II and um, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and you see that, from first of all, from the fact that one of the most important civil rights groups, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was actually founded in 1942 um, during the war. And uh, basically, <clears throat> after the war, blacks felt that their sacrifices in the war their blood, their toil, their tears, their sweat, uh, should be recognized with an end to segregation and to discrimination. And um, that was incredibly important in terms of getting the civil rights movement jump-started in the late 40s and 50s. Uh, there was also a campaign mounted in during World War II called the Double V Campaign in the African American community. Uh, basically, the idea was that if we're gonna win victory over Hitler, we got to have victory over racism here. We got to get all the people, black and white, on the same page, working together without racism, without prejudice, uh, to win this war. So uh, the war became a very, very important moment for African Americans, and we'll continue to talk about that in future lectures. Other effects on the home front: <clears throat> basically, there was such a high demand for workers um, during the war that uh, labor unions really, really benefited and were able to get excellent um, work, uh, wages and benefits for their, uh, their members. And industries basically were not in a position to refuse their demands. Um, and so pretty much all the seg sectors of industry that had not unionized before successfully unionized during World War II, even the Ford Motor Company, which had resisted for years uh, finally recognized the United Auto Workers Union during the war. Um, but also the steel industry, which had been a holdout, unionized during the war. Um, however, in other ways, FDR's war policies really benefited the largest of the large corporations because they were the ones who had the industrial capacity to really make a huge impact and meet the war quotas for production. And so huge corporations were the ones that benefited most and made the highest profits um, off the war. So also in terms of uh, taxation, uh, just like in World War II, 
uh, ex- World War One, excuse me, uh, income taxes went up dramatically uh, to finance the war effort. And also the way that income taxes were collected changed. Uh, withholding was invented during World War II. Uh, before World War II, you basically had to send a check to the government four times a year for your income tax, but during World War II, someone hit on the idea of, let's just take it out of their paychecks, and that'll be less painful. <laughs> and so uh, that's why nowadays uh, they take, you know, the government takes the money before we see it uh, from, our, from our paychecks. We owe that to World War II. And um, the wartime prosperity meant that uh, people's incomes were increasing, so more and more people than ever before had to pay income taxes. There were 13 million new taxpayers added to the tax rolls um, during World War II. And uh, the government used propaganda to try to convince people that it was patriotic to pay their taxes. And believe it or not, uh, one of the propaganda spokesmen for this effort was none other than Donald Duck. and I have a supplemental video, so uh, in a second, just pause this video, go to the supplemental videos folder, and look at the Donald Duck cartoon um, in which Donald um, tries to teach the American people that they should pay their taxes in order to sink the axis. Okay, welcome back. Well, pretty mind-blowing, huh? So even uh, even Walt Disney, even Donald Duck, could be used for wartime propaganda. Um, and you better believe it, you know, it wasn't just Hitler who was a master of propaganda. We had our own war propaganda, uh, as, this, uh, as that little cartoon shows. Um, so all of this, once again, tended to increase the size of of the federal government just like in world war one and it really set the stage for economic developments after uh world war ii especially the rise of what's been called the welfare state the idea that the government should uh, have massive spending programs to take care of people in terms of health care old age pensions um unemployment insurance and and so forth and basically the welfare state originated from the ideas of a British economist named John Maynard Keynes. Um, Keynes believed that if you were going to prevent economic depressions, it was uh, necessary for governments to uh, spend uh, more of the gross national product, that government spending must um, increase. And certainly uh, saw that during World War II in this country, the total federal budget, believe it or not, in 1939 was only $9 billion. Not trillion, $9 billion. But by 1945, it had increased tenfold, up to $95 billion. And people saw that the country had come out of the Great Depression because of all this wartime spending, and so that tended to give some credibility uh, to Keynes' uh, argument. And so... Um, if there is a modern welfare state in this country, again, um, as in so many other areas, World War II was hugely influential in that. Well, um, as I'm sure you all know, we did finally open up a second front in Western Europe on June 6, 1944, D-Day, when uh, US and uh, British troops invaded the beaches of Normandy and began working their way towards Berlin. Meanwhile, uh, the U.S. troops engaged in the Pacific were continuing the very difficult, painful task of uh, moving from island to island, conquering uh, islands, meeting with fierce, fierce resistance from uh, Japanese troops who were determined uh, not to surrender even an inch of ground. Well, Unbelievably, Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected uh, again to the White House for his fourth term in 1944. And uh, this is no longer possible, by the way, because after World War II, people decided that this was too much and a constitutional amendment was passed um, to uh, say that officially now the president can only serve two terms. 
but Roosevelt was the only man in history to be elected four times um, to the White House. However, his second term uh, lasted a very short time. Um, on April 12, 1945, um, Roosevelt was actually in Georgia. And uh, why was he there? Well, of course, you saw from the video he had polio. And um, he had purchased a spa in Warm Springs, Georgia, that he had converted into a facility for people who had polio uh, to get therapy in the, in the waters there. And so he often visited there. He built the little White House there. You can go see it. It's not very far um, from Albany. And uh, so essentially, Warm Springs, Georgia was FDR's second home. And it just happened that on April 12, 1945, he was there with his old girlfriend, Lucy Rutherford, unbeknownst to Eleanor. They had rekindled their relationship, although um, most, I think, historians believe they were not sexually involved at this point. They were still very close friends. And she was there with him he was sitting for a portrait uh which is on display at the little white house his last portrait and suddenly he put his hand to his forehead and he said i have a terrible pain and then he slumped over uh fdr had had a cerebral hemorrhage and he died there on april 12th 1945. now the outpouring of grief in america was it's something that I, I you know, it, it was absolutely extraordinary. And um, FDR was one of our most beloved presidents, and especially ordinary people uh, really honored and admired him. Many people had images of FDR in their homes. Um, and so the grief was unbelievable. And so FDR's uh, coffin traveled by train um, through the country from Georgia to the, uh, Washington, and then from Washington to Hyde Park where he's buried and everywhere it went thousands and thousands of people just came out and stood by the railroad tracks um, crying their eyes out because their president had died and there's a very touching uh, story I want to tell you um, that was reported that as um, FDR's coffin was going through the streets of Washington um, there was a man who was kneeling down on his knees just sobbing as if his heart would break and a reporter witnessed this another man came up to him and lifted him up and tried to comfort him um and finally the second man said to the first man well did you know the president and the first man said no but he knew me and i think that gives you a sense of how people felt about fdr that that he knew ordinary people and that he cared about them. Um, so there was incredible mourning at his death, um, which of course made uh, the next president, Harry Truman, uh, Harry Truman from Missouri, who was FDR's last vice president, became the president uh, in 1945. Um, well, uh, the Soviets were closing in on Berlin from the east. They actually got there before the U.S. troops did. We were closing in from the west. Hitler knew the game was up, so he went into his underground bunker below Berlin uh, with his longtime mistress, Ava Brown, and they got married on April 29th, 1945. And then uh, the morning of April 30th, Hitler and his new wife, Ava, um, took poison and committed suicide. Wow, that Hitler. He really knew how to plan a romantic wedding and honeymoon. You know, what can he say about that? Um, so that was the end of the war in Europe. Um, and so VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, when the Germans officially surrendered, was May 8th, 1945. Um, and meanwhile, the war effort in the Pacific was still going on, but it was going better. Uh, by March 1945, uh, we had gotten close enough to bomb the Japanese homeland. Um, one key victory in March 1945 was when uh, we took the island of Iwo Jima. And you see on the left there the very famous photograph of the U.S. Marines raising the American flag over uh, Iwo Jima. So uh, we began bombing Japan. The first major bombing raid on March 9, 1945 became known as the firebombing of Tokyo. Basically, we dropped a chemical on Japan, on Tokyo, that was similar to the napalm that was used in Vietnam. 
It was a chemical that would burst into flames on contact with organic material. And Tokyo's houses were almost totally made of wood and paper screens. So Tokyo just went up in flames. Um, at least 80,000, up to 100,000 citizens of Tokyo were killed in the firebombing. But still, Japan refused to surrender. And the new president, Harry S. Truman, was faced with a dilemma. How can we bring this war to a close without losing millions of lives of American troops? Um, Truman knew that if we invaded Japan, there would be fierce house-to-house -house fighting. The Japanese would not want to surrender. Um, and we would lose up to millions, pro probably millions of lives. And so it was Truman who took maybe the most difficult decision that any American president had to face. Um, during the war, there were a number of mostly Jews who had fled Europe who came to this country. Um, and yes, being high-level scientists, these people were welcomed here because it was known that they would help the war effort. And so in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, they got together and carried out what was known as the Manhattan Project to build an atomic bomb. And obviously these Jews, Jewish refugees were highly motivated to, to do this before Hitler got the A-bomb. He was also working on one. And this effort was successful. And so the first atomic bomb, uh, which was called Little Boy, uh, was dropped on Hiroshima uh, on August the 6th, 1945. Um, and actually, leaflets had been sent out across Japan warning that a huge bombing attack was to be expected, warning to the Japanese to evacuate their cities, but um, there was little response to that. So when we dropped the A-bomb on Hiroshima, again, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed, if not immediately, then later by exposure to radiation. Uh, and you see the aftermath here in Hiroshima um, three days later, uh, we dropped another atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. And finally, the Emperor Hirohito, with much opposition from his high command, um, brought it about that Japan uh, did surrender finally. So it was really... Uh, the atomic bomb that ended World War II in the Pacific, making World War II the first and only nuclear war we have ever fought to date. But um, it was rather ominous for the post-war world, because this issue of uh, atomic weapons would come to dominate the entire period after World War II, as we'll see in the next lecture.